So good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is uh, Carlo Ratti. I'm um, head of the MIT Sensible City Lab, a research group at, uh, at MIT, both in Boston and uh, in Singapore. And um, um, we have today now a very exciting panel on uh, modern urban utopias. Uh, you know, the people we have here are people actually really building cities from scratch, different initiatives in different parts of the world, uh, with different type of budget and different type of uh, engagement of public and private. Um, we had a discussion just a moment ago about which language should we speak. So somebody started saying, well, maybe I should talk, speak English, speak Chinese. And then uh, somebody say, well, then I will speak Arabic. And then I will speak Russian. So well, in the end, we're going to have the panel in, issue, in, in English. Uh, so, uh, but uh, um, we might have some Chinese words in, uh, in, the, in the middle. Uh, now, uh, we're going to start this by actually having a quick look and a quick hearing a, bit, a few words about each of the cities, and then we'll have a discussion about really how the projects developed, uh, you know, common threads, and you know, what are the critical issues they're facing. And so I would suggest to, to do this, and to start, we got a few slides. Uh, so maybe um, Jacob uh, for, um, for the slides, uh, telling us about uh, Skolkovo in Russia. Good in English. Okay. In Russia, not in Russian. <laughs> Um, so before I talk about the city, I want to tell you what Skolkovo is, um, and, uh, what the essence of Skolkovo is. Uh, Skolkovo is an effort by the Russian government uh, to diversify uh, the Russian economy by allowing the commercialization of uh, new technologies um, in five areas, biotechnology, um, uh, IT, energy efficiency, space, and uh, nuclear technologies. Uh, there was a federal law passed uh, two years ago uh, to allow for this idea uh, to happen. Um, basically, what we want to do through Skolkovo is to allow startups uh, to form. Uh, we want to provide these startups with tax incentives, with access to uh, facilities like the proper laboratory space, um, and we want to give them grants which are then matched by, uh, by private funds. And basically, at the end of the day, we want these companies to prosper and thrive and create um, the next uh, Facebook, the next Apple, Google, Yandex, Kaspersky Labs. Um, the, the city uh, has been designed to facilitate uh, the commercial, commercialization of those uh, technologies. Uh, we currently have already, although the city hasn't been built yet, it just has been designed. We're starting construction next week. The city already, ha or, or Skokov already has 400 startup companies that are already uh, working and trying to commercialize their technologies. Um, when we designed Skolkova City, and you can see here in front of you, uh, we took uh, leading master planners and architects uh, from around the world. So the master plan was developed by a rep, and it's a mixed-use uh, community uh, located on uh, 400 hectares of land, four square kilometers, so we're a small and compact city uh, for 20,000 inhabitants. So 20,000 people will live in the city, and 40,000 people uh, will work in the city. Um, so, as I said, the master plan was created by a rep, and then we strongly believe in very good architecture. So we uh, contracted and engaged leading architects in Russia and around the world to actually design each of the districts. Uh, so, for example, the heart of the city, there are two districts that form the heart of the city. If you can see the pancake-shaped uh, pancake, uh, sh uh, uh, images, that's the university district, and that was uh, designed by the Pritzker winner, uh, Pierre de Miron. Um, the university has been established uh, together with MIT. Um, then the, uh, the bar-shaped uh, images uh, form the uh, Technopark. The Technopark is uh, approximately 150,000 square meters of space, and in the Technopark, our, uh, our innovators will be working and, uh, and hopefully uh, commercializing the technologies. If we can go, go, on, go on to the next slide. Is, or I need to... Is that, is that the clicker over there? Where is, right. I'll click, excuse me. Not a click. Okay, so like I said, um, we strongly believe that uh, for, the, for the innovators to prosper and to be successful, they need to have everything at the, uh, at the tip of their hands. So the city is a mixed-use community. Um, if you look, for example, at the Technopark district, uh, the blue space is office space and laboratory space, and then the orange and yellow space is actually housing, 
uh, and uh, all the different amenities that anyone would need to, to live in a city, like uh, educational facilities um, and, and hospitals. Um, and the same, the same theme goes throughout the city. The uh, purple space is the university, again, it's established with MIT. And then across the road, you have the residential space, the dormitories for, for the students. And then we have the, at the su southern end of the city, the fish type uh, shape that is a uh, residential district with office space. Um, one of the key elements of the city is that not only will we have startups in the university, we also believe that the startups need to mix with large multinational companies uh, to learn how to commercialize. Um, so we are bringing in uh, what we call our key partners, companies like Cisco, um, Intel, IBM, also large Russian companies to set up R&D facilities in the city. They will be doing that in the V1 district and also in the uh, D4 district. Um, in essence, the role of the, of the, uh, key of the companies is to set up R&D facilities. It will, will give them access to markets and, uh, and also will, uh, will also allow the startups to learn from, from the multinationals in terms of com how to commercialize their technologies. Um, some of the architecture, again, one of, uh, it was mentioned yesterday by one of the speakers that architecture uh, drives, the, drives a city, and, and we really believe that. So uh, you can see here the Technopark, um, each of the bars represents one of the technology clusters where the innovators will be working. Here you can see also in the background a dome which has been designed by the uh, Japanese architect uh, uh, Sijima from the uh, architectural bureau Sana. The dome uh, actually covers a, a space where there will be a microclimate, so basically any time during the year uh, the temperature will be between be 25 and uh, 28 degrees. Um, and again, uh, we strongly believe uh, in creating something new and, and exciting and innovative for Russia, so we really focused on the on, on the architecture. Just another image of the, uh, of the uh, Technopark space. Again, it's an open city. Uh, there are no, no gates. Uh, and again, as many people coming in as possible, mixing and sharing ideas. Uh, here, uh, you see here a lot of green space. Uh, half of the city actually will be parkland. Uh, we really believe in green spaces, open spaces where people can uh, can walk around, think about their ideas, and, uh, and create. And uh, uh, here you can see the uh, low-rise residential. Uh, the community will not have any, uh, uh, anything higher than five floors. It's a low-rise development. This is the university uh, designed by Pierre de Miron. Um, and um, Professor Crowley, who is from MIT, is heading the university. And this is going to be a postgraduate university with 1,200 students. And the idea here is that uh, if you look at, for example, the Silicon Valley model or the model they have in Israel, in Silicon Valley they have very two strong universities, uh, Berkeley and Stanford. The folks there complete their studies and go across the road and start in innovation. The same model goes for Israel. And here we believe uh, that the same model applies. Uh, once, you, you develop your, once you develop your, uh, your, uh, your, your, your science, go across the road and start commercializing. Um, we want to have a smart and connected city. Uh, so over the last year together with uh, Cisco, we've been developing the smart and connected uh, concept, which essentially means that uh, through a very strong and uh, robust ICT network, we want to deliver services, both regulated and non-regulated services, uh, to the uh, end user or to the company, which is located in Skolkovo uh, through a virtual service provider, which, that mean, which, which means essentially that the virtual service provider, which is a company, delivers all the services to the, uh, to the, to the citizen. The citizen doesn't have to have numerous bills and numerous uh, focal points to receiving those services. So if you want to receive something like telephone services, um, video services, or ed educational health services, you'll be able through this open Exchange Network receive all the services, and at the end of the month, you'll have a bill, one bill with all the services. So this is some, these are some of the key elements of Skolko. Carl, back to you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, well, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for, for um, this presentation on, um, on Russia. And from Russia, we'll uh, now, I would suggest that we move. There's a lot of similarity with uh, KSA, with Saudi Arabia, the kingdom, and uh, with King Abdallah Economic City. Um, so it would be great to hear more about actually what is, uh, what is happening there and, uh, and uh, the similarities in the sense that both economies actually 
economies relying heavily on oil that are trying to develop a city in order to develop new IP and new business model, new economies, new companies, new startups. So, um, to you, Fad. Thank you. Well, I want to tell you first about a very interesting experience I've had today. So first of all, they tell me I have to talk about urban utopia. Can you imagine the crushing pressure you feel from being responsible for building the urban utopia? So that was the first challenge. The second challenge, everybody has slides and I don't. And I didn't know I could use slides because it would have been relieved a lot of this crushing pressure. The third, they said I can't speak in Arabic. So in the spirit of the Arab Spring, I'm going to actually speak in Arabic. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll really make it brief. Uh, King Abdullah Economic City is being built on the western side of the country. Um, uh, it's being built for 2 million people. The size physically is about the size of Washington, D.C. It has a port, it has an industrial zone, and the residential and service components that, like any other uh, city would have. Uh, now, uh, it's an innovative par uh, uh, public-private partnership, if you will. The government has not put in up uh, any money in the equity base of, of the project. We actually created the company, we assembled the land, we bought it, and um, guess what? Publicly listed it on day one with all of the infrastructure investments that you have to make. Um, again, the point of pressure. You can tell I'm, I'm, uh, I have high pr blood pressure right now, right? Um, uh, and uh, with the pressure of quarterly reporting, et cetera, uh, on a project of this size. Um, the government has been exceptionally supportive, though, in uh, the, the model because they created it as a special economic zone. We have our own privilege regulations. And it's connecting us with the infrastructure through um, roads, power, uh, et cetera. Uh, now, we've been doing this for six years. So what are the results to date? Uh, we have been able to uh, attract over 30 companies, global companies, to establish uh, their bases there, including Mars, Total, Sanofi Aventis, Pfizer, etc. Uh, we have attracted over 10 billion euro worth of uh, investments that will be executed over the next two years. Um, uh, the port will open next year. And um, uh, thankfully, we, are, we broke even last year. Uh, so the pressure is certainly a lot less uh, right now. Um, uh, and um, we have already started uh, getting people uh, into the city. So the city is uh, uh, getting to the operational phase. Thank you. Thank you. So then uh, from, uh, from Saudi, I would suggest to move to China. Uh, so Chin, um, if you'd like to share with us about uh, your city, and uh, I understand we have some slides coming. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as a planner, I'm... Uh, it's my pleasure to share the experience with the city manager. Uh, normally, the planner think um, before, before the uh, city manager. <laughs> uh, so uh, today, I take the Suzhou Industry Park as a case. Uh, Suzhou Industry Park is a national park. It's about 10, 20 minutes, uh, minutes from Shanghai by the railway. And it started built from 1994. So we actually we already finished all the uh, projects. The area is about 80 uh, square kilometers. And uh, the population is about 0 0.7 million. So uh, actually the um, purpose or say um, objective of the, this project, this Suzhou Industry Park is to Stimulate, stimulate uh, uh, economic. <clears throat> this uh, in China, this is the most uh, uh, competitive in, in park, industry park in China. So uh, even in the uh, last uh, uh, 16 years, the economic growth, the GDP growth rate is uh, uh, 30 percent every year. So um, it brings, uh, it creates a lot of job opportunities and it brings the economic growth, especially in the, to mobilize the foreign investment. In this area, about uh, 86, 86 uh, foreign um, companies uh, have the branch in this area. 
And the sec second thing is, uh, in the beginning, we built this area to, uh, because of to, uh, to increase uh, economic growth. And now, actually, it began to, it changed to a new city. Uh, now, it, uh, it, uh, the function is changing. In the beginning, it is only for the industry. Now, they have six functions. They have, uh, there are high-tech industry, zero uh, zone, and the commercial zone, education zone, ecotourism zone, uh, boundaries zone, and the science zone. So, uh, oh, I should say uh, this area is more livable. Uh, this is the landscape, landscape of this area because uh, this park is, has, has been built around the lake, majority are commercial area. But in the beginning, uh, you could say in the left, uh, left corner, the picture of the, uh, in the left corner, this is the majority uh, land as a factory. So the function is changing now, uh, more uh, tourism place and more commercial uh, places are built. Uh, but uh, um, as the industry park always say, uh, we also has a similar like, special uh, economic zone uh, in China is very popular and already uh, spread out the, all the country. So now in this place, we have the new approach to improve urban competitive. That is the city agglomeration. So uh, the, the pink, pink point is the uh, Suzhou Industrial Park. So this, this area already, um, um, this city, urban area already, uh, we should say this region is an urban region. So in, in China, in the, this five uh, national plan, uh, city agglomeration is the most uh, important strategy for the whole city, uh, for the whole country. So uh, the urbanization strategy in China is uh, to developing more city agglomeration. So we are going to uh, build this uh, city agglomeration and uh, this will be the national strategy. Uh, we call the uh, Sunan uh, city agglomeration and uh, it's including 12 cities and uh, uh, around the people is uh, uh, 20, 28 million people. Uh, this big area, we connected by the uh, railway and the uh, expressway and uh, we try to make them uh, tra transit more freely. So <clears throat> we have three three uh, methods to approach this, uh, to make it happen. And the one is uh, make the uh, uh, transportation is uh, more uh, convenient. For example, like, uh, like a, light, a light railway and uh, public transportation is in, in this region uh, and uh, connect uh, the tw uh, 12 cities by the uh, expressway. And the second, uh, 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 second aspect is, is uh, we try to make the, all the facilities to build together and share together and the investment from the different uh, cities. And the third service is uh, the, the function we have some kind of uh, distribution in the different cities. So make the whole uh, region to be the most competitive uh, we say in China, we say we, we, we would like to let this uh, region to be, uh, to have the most uh, international competitive. competitive. So uh, this is the case from China. Thank you. Thank you, Chin. And so just to, um, to finish our um, introductory introduction about the cases, um, uh, Scott, I'd like to ask you to present La Vasa and you know what you're doing in, in India and uh, your exciting case study. Thank you very much. Lavasa um, is about 100 square kilometers in size and is about 200 kilometers southeast of Mumbai, uh, near what is, I believe, the, the most productive uh, economic corridor in India, the uh, Pune-Mumbai uh, corridor. It, um, uh, it is built in different phases. Each town has its own uh, uh, new urbanism-based town center, and uh, um, the 
understanding the project, I think, needs to be understood in the context of, a, of the national environment. Um, yesterday morning, uh, the chairman of Hindustan Construction Corporation, which is the parent company of Lavasa Corporation, spoke a little bit about that, about the, the unprecedented uh, change of, uh, of rural Indians to urban Indians, 300 to 350 million people between now and, and 2050 uh, moving into urban centers that are already unable to handle them because of congestion and inadequate infrastructure and so forth. And so what Lavasa is, is a, is a commercial response to that very real demographic need um, and is offered up at a time when the size of the Indian middle class is growing and they have disposable income to, to, to buy this kind of, uh, of a product. So it has to be understood in, in that context. In fact, uh, depending on, on who you read, there is a need for, uh, this, re this really shows the size of the numbers in India. 200 to 300, even 500 new cities of 300 to 500,000 population in size needed in order to divert a significant amount of this rural to urban migration uh, away from the cities. And so what Lavasa is, is a response to that. And one of several models that we think should be, should be built as a way of demonstrating uh, that uh, here, here's, a, here's a different model for, for doing that. Now, uh, apart from issues of, of poor local governance in, in India, one of the biggest impediments to building new cities is that the money necessary for the infrastructure is in the trillions of dollars. And, uh, and that's simply not available from uh, the state and center government. And so one of the things that's a little bit different, uh, significantly different about Lavasa, is that uh, to a certain extent, like King Abdullah Economic City, there's no government money in the project. Uh, the government has given us permission. They've given us uh, the, the, the enabling legislation. We have the government's permission. We do not have the government's uh, support. And so all of the money for the project comes from the parent corporation, from equity, from bank loans, from sales to customers and so forth. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a picture of the master plan that covers about uh, 100 square kilometers. And uh, it's uh, the actual master planning, which was done by a US-based uh, um, city planner, HOK, based out of uh, St. Louis, has actually given about 55% of this total area to, uh, to master planning. The first phase, which is on the north side of the reservoir, about smack dab in the middle, is called Dasve. Um, we're about uh, one and a half years away from having that one completely built out. All the pictures that you uh, will, will see here are pictures of the actual uh, uh, Dasve um, and other parts of, of Lavasa. So we operate uh, not as a, a, a city under Indian law with, statutory, with, with a statutory form, but as, as what uh, the state law calls a special planning authority, which gives us the authority to adopt a, the, a master plan, to, to adopt and enforce development control regulations which go along with the master plan, and to provide various services during the development period, um, but we are not a city under Indian law. And so one of our challenges uh, going forward from here is, uh, is to come up with a statutory governance form that not only is democratic, which it has to be in, in India, but which also provides for the protection of uh, a large amount of public-private partnership. Because there's no government money in it, uh, part of the business plan is, uh, is that the money for the project, for its long-term financial sustainability, really comes from, well, three pots, if you will. The first is the, the traditional sale of, of, of real estate, the, uh, the second is to calve off uh, the, the city services function, and they can raise monies from traditional uh, fee for services and, uh, and charges in lieu of taxes, which we're allowed to do, uh, as well as annuities paid back to the, uh, to the parent corporation uh, in place of the bond and interest payment that I would otherwise have to make if I was building uh, a city with, with, with traditional bonds. And the third source of money, which is really, I think, the more creative part of the business plan, is that Lavasa Corporation has invested to date in more than 40 joint ventures. Joint ventures with, with niche companies um, in, in, in how to do industrial laundries or hotels or lakeshore uh, or, or marinas or, uh, or infrastructure or power, power systems who will invest in those 
Um, and then as the real estate revenues would naturally decline 15 to 20 years into the project, they can be replaced by mature operating revenues in these, in these joint ventures. So that's, uh, that's the business plan. You can see that we have uh, parts of the, uh, of the in infrastructure already built uh, and, and uh, parts of it to master planned in, in four, four different phases. Uh, we, um, we came into an area that uh, was, was relatively remote which meant that uh, at Lavasse's expense, we had to build the, uh, not only the power grid, but also its interconnection into the, into the Indian grid. Um, we had to build uh, uh, 54 kilometers of roadway to, the, to Pune, the nearest uh, tier one city. Uh, the, uh, the indigenous population in an, an area of only of, of 100 square kilometers was relatively sparse, about 3,000 uh, villagers. But, uh, but to make sure that we have a strong commitment to, uh, to raising their quality of, of life, we've, uh, we've, built, we've rebuilt their, um, their villages, uh, their infrastructure, and uh, in the case of this photograph, have built a school uh, that provides uh, English immersion uh, ed education to, the, to students that would otherwise not have access to that kind uh, of education. Um, Finally, uh, I mentioned that the, each of the phases, and, and the project is being built in phases so that we can build the infrastructure first and then, uh, and, and then build the, the buildings after it rather than have to tear up uh, buildings to put the infrastructure uh, in. Each of the phases uh, has its own town center uh, incorporating concepts of, of new urbanism. Now, new urbanism is not new to, uh, to India. In fact, it started in, in North America. Uh, but about 80% of the population and the density in each one of these uh, phases is within about a 15-minute walk of the things that you would normally need in the course of, uh, of, of daily life. And so it's certainly our objective to, um, to discourage the use of private automobiles uh, as, as often as we can. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, um, so the, the scale and the, the scope of all these endeavors is, is breathtaking. And many questions come to mind. And I think what we would like to do now is, uh, is really have a discussion, discussion here, but also with some of you uh, in the audience about you know, some of the key challenges, uh, some challenges about we heard about, about you know, how the different economic model works, uh, how the governance structure work, uh, you know, also about the architecture, the master planning, how do you do it? And perhaps you know, just to, to start a conversation, it might be interesting to really to start from that. Because you know, if you think about cities, you know, cities didn't exist once upon a time. You know, 7,000 years we didn't have cities. And then you know, they start, they start and today over half of the world's population is in cities. We hear how many more people are moving to cities. But for thousands and thousands of years, cities have been a kind of spontaneous process that started in a bottom-up way. So a spontaneous bottom-up way of city building. And it's only recently that we started to, do, to plan cities in a kind of top-down way. Like in, uh, in the past centuries, you've got main examples like Chandigarh, built by Corbusier in uh, the capital of Punjab, or cities like Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. But then you those examples of cities planned in a top-down way, in a kind of vertical way by master planners, by team of architects and engineers, well, have been a kind of failure. And then maybe that's a good question to, to, to start asking is, you know, I mean, can you really plan a city top down? Can, how do you do it? And how can you avoid that uh, we don't repeat some of the mistakes of the past century? Who would like to start? Well, I can if uh, you allow me. Uh, Winston Churchill once said that uh, we shape buildings, thereafter they shape us. And I think we all agree that uh, this is definitely true for cities, uh, even more so than buildings. Um, in our case, because we're building on a greenfield site, you can't do bottom up. You have to do top down. But if you do the top down, you know, identifying which sectors you want to attract, uh, what kind of infrastructure that is required, and hence what kind of jobs are created, and what kind of housing and amenities you need to provide, that's great. But do you have the mechanism to get feedback from the stakeholders to be a and the flexibility to be able to change these plans? I think this is the most important um, aspect of building a city and even maintaining a living city. And you, we talked yesterday about Detroit and what happened in Detroit, et cetera. Really, governance is about getting the right people at, to the right places and then getting uh, stakeholder feedback and implementing that. Because it's great if you can have great leaders, but you, can't, you don't get 
uh, proper feedback from the stakeholders, and it's great if you have proper feedback from the stakeholders, but you don't have the right leadership to actually implement it or the mechanisms. So having this is very important. In our case, it's actually quite simple. As a company, we have shareholders. Anybody with a $20 ownership in stocks can actually come to our annual shareholder assembly and tell us exactly what they don't like about what we're doing. All our information is public. But more importantly, day in and day out, our customer, the person that lives in the city or buys property, etc., tells us exactly what they don't like every day. And we have the ability, because we are a private sector developer, to go back and immediately change these things. In fact, over the past five years, our master plan was, this is, we're actually conducting the fourth change to the master plan, because we're getting this continuous customer feedback. And we have completely revised our, our business plan almost yearly uh, to reflect this customer change. And most of the change is actually positive. We've heard, we've listened, we, we understand what the market uh, is demanding. And, and you say, you know, people tell you this. Is, do you have any particular method or, you know, to, to, to get this feedback? Do you have any platform for that? Yeah, great. If, somebody, if you put a product out in the market and it doesn't sell, you know you didn't do a good job. <laughs> Uh, so from that perspective, it's very quick. So, so how, how can you tell if, a city, if your city is, is, uh, is selling? So I mean, how, how do you get the feedback from the customer? Um, you, you get it directly in the market. You go to, um, uh, you can ask your customers, obviously, but the idea if the customer is buying, like any other product, I mean, the city at the end of the day is a group of products, right? It's a group of products and a, and a place where people get together to use these products. And um, uh, you, you know, we know that our industrial offering is fantastic because all of the major industries are moving in. We know that our, some of our housing is not so good because it's not being sold. Um, we know from the people that are living here that they have challenges. So, so um, you know, we're forced to listen. You don't need to wait for an election for the next mayor to, you, you know, this is continuous, constant kind of feedback that comes uh, along. And um, as, uh, as, uh, as a result, you're forced to change it, which I think uh, is it's quite positive. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, even if you know sometimes not all interests are aligned, somebody might invest and actually give feedback. Is not the same person who might live there or or, or work there. But I, I'm curious. For instance, in a, in a case like Scott, in your case, uh, where actually you're just starting now to, to bring people there, um, how how is this process implemented? Or oh, feedback? Well, I, I think in Lavasa's case, our answer is similar to Fahaz, um, but uh, with an Indian uh, twist. I mean, we're starting with a green grass side as well, so there is no bottom uh, really. To, to govern from, we have to do the master plan um, in a, in, in a top-down way. And actually, in India, local land use is very top-down. In fact, we're trying to sort of reverse that just, just a little bit. A small change to, uh, to a city's uh, land use plan requires approval at the, uh, the state level, which is why one of the innovations that we've been able to, uh, to craft is so important. The, the special planning authority that we have actually gives more autonomy to the Lavasa Special Planning Authority to make those kinds of decisions than is even given to other cities in the, in the state of Maharashtra to make minor changes, as long as we don't go outside the basic boundaries of, of, the, of, of the development ratio or the height and, and, and certain other requirements, then, then we're allowed to make those kinds of decisions. That autonomy given to us has actually fairly recently become fairly controversial uh, because it's not perceived as, uh, as democratic. And so very, from the very beginning, I believe we've been thinking about ways that as the city becomes more populated, how are we going to make sure that the bottom-up aspect is, is taken care of? Um, the, uh, the area that Lavasa is in um, has seven different panchayat, they're called, but it's, but it's, it, it's the village council. Uh, boards uh, that are that are the the lowest level of, of local government in in India, and so we have a village committee that sort of meets with representatives of those seven panchayats on a nearly monthly basis, so that we're giving all the same information. Our committee doesn't have any legal standing, uh, but it's a, but it's a way of making sure that we maintain a dialogue that we're saying the same thing to all seven of the of the panchayats. Um, in India, because of the poor quality of, of local government services, the, almost everybody lives in a housing society. Even in the slums of Mumbai, people have housing societies to provide for services in, in solid waste and security and recreation and other things that the local government might not provide. In Lavasa, we don't have housing societies, but we will, what we know, we'll have to have a dialogue with the same groups of people in different regions, in different buildings, in different neighborhoods to make sure that, that their needs are being met. 
And even in this early stage, we have a, a fairly sophisticated system of capturing uh, customer concerns, complaints, suggestions that come into our, um, our, our, our citizen database, into our, into our citizen call center, what in the United States we would call a 311 center, and other, and other ways of gathering this information, both from people who already live there, as well as those um, who are prospective residents. So that um, in the aggregate, these different ways of making sure that we have an informal conversation and dialogue can be slowly progressed into more institutionalized ways that will become the local government. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, uh, well, Jagan, what about your case? You know, you, you've yeah. talked before about uh, some of the great architects you involved on the on the master plan, and we, we know that you know great <laughs> architects usually are not the most uh, uh, open to actually have uh, uh, the users or the people make suggestions about the design or intervene with design. It comes to mind the Corbusier's hand proposing his idea for Paris, which was basically demolish everything. You know, just keep Notre Dame as a nice. Uh, Thing from the past and uh, and redo everything in his style. So uh, how do you how do you cope with that? That's a great question. Can you imagine getting um, you know two Pritzker Prize winners along with the other famous architects you know into one room? It, 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 frankly, at some point it was it was extremely challenging. Um, I can tell you a lot of stories about this. But anyway, but we uh, are taking a mix of bottom up and top down approach. On the, other hand, on the one hand, we have very strong support, uh, political support from the Russian government, and that's manifested basically in two key aspects. First of all, uh, they've allocated capital, about 50% of the capital, to, to build the city. And the other uh, way we can see the strong support is basically by establishing the law to create Skolkovo and handing out grants to the, to the innovators. Um, other than that, they've told us, go ahead, go off and, and build the city and, and make it work. Um, and so we've gathered these architects and through what we call quarterly urban council planning sessions, uh, the architects come in and they present their ideas and their architectural forms to basically the, all the key stakeholders of the city, which whether it's the young innovators, uh, people from business, academia, and I can tell you the discussions there that we have are very vigorous. You can't imagine the discussions we had on the, on the dome, right? Um, so at the end of the day, you know, we sit there, we have the discussion, it's very open, it's very transparent, it's published in the newspaper, and we come and make a decision. Um, but we're in Skokwa, Skoko, I believe that needs to be, for Skokwa to be successful, it needs to be an open system where we, uh, you know, we can accumulate all the knowledge, both in Russia and outside of Russia. I'm, for example, the deputy city manager, but I'm not a Russian citizen. Right? They brought me in because they felt I had a few you know, interesting ideas to give them. Um, you know, you're going to Russia on Friday, you know, with the intent of giving your ideas. And we really want to listen and incorporate all of the ideas. So that's happening right now during the design phase. We also have, for example, a smart city council. We want to make the city smart. What that means is essentially having an in, um, uh, in, integrated operations center that we build. Actually, actually let's, let's finish for a moment. Let's talk about smart in a moment. The next question okay. for you will be how smart you are, so, how, how okay. smart your cities are. Okay. You know, what, what so you're we're doing. using the, the really trying to get all the inputs and yeah. using the top and bottom. Of but it. just to finish on this point, I want yeah. to ask Chin, uh, maybe on, on, from your point of view, because your model is still different uh, about you know, how you're managing the developments and, and how your master plan is. So could you, could you share it with us? Okay. Uh, actually, in China case, I think it's very easy to make uh, uh, the plan uh, from the top to down, because uh, in China there are very strong uh, governance from top to down. And uh, another thing is the land is uh, land property is uh, belong to the government. So um, for us in the um, I should say in the past thirty years, um, all the plan is from the top to down. And uh, uh, just like uh, in my slides. Uh, I say uh, there are some transition happening in the Suzhou Industry Park in the beginning. That is the industry park, but now that is uh, some uh, that is a new city. There are more uh, uh, commercial area and the residential area. So uh, I think now it it, it is uh, um, more considering about the local people uh, requirement uh, needs. Yeah. So. Uh, I think in, in China, it, this is easy to make it. But uh, uh, I think uh, the problem um, during the process is to, uh, because the rural area is still, uh, is a, that is a very large number in China. So uh, during the, we develop the new, new cities, uh, 
the most uh, serious problem is to relocate to some village people. So uh, this is a, sometime it happens some problem, but uh, we try to resolve it. Uh, major, uh, has social... there been any kind of bottom-up way to try to, instead of relocating people, to try to involve them and yeah, you know, yeah. make them part of the uh, city? In the different places, there are different uh, ways, because uh, in Suzhou case, uh, it is easy to make because they get a lot, a lot of um, revenue from the land selling. So they, have, they, they can let uh, village people get benefits. Uh, so they would like to move to the new places. Uh, but uh, in some places, maybe it is hard. But they can, uh, the government can give some job, job opportunities to the village people. So uh, at least now in China, we, we, we make it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, so different ways of looking at things in a bottom-up, top-down uh, way, and you know, and probably uh, as we also have seen over the past few years, how bottom-up technology changed a lot of things. You know, the, from the Occupy movement to the Arab Spring, and there, there's a big question there in planning is about how all of this could actually uh, bring us back to a way of city making that actually is much more similar to the way humanity did city building for uh, thousands of years. But, uh, but this then, about the tech, from the technology, then there's a good transition to, to what Jack already just mentioned before, um, which is the next question. And uh, you know, is, uh, we heard a lot about it over the past couple of days, how uh, cities are changing, and are changing very fast because of uh, the new technological environment. So the way you know, all of the, this idea that you can call and relate smart cities, but uh, you know, basically uh, the fact that they um, are becoming more responsive, more optimized, and more sustainable and efficient because of this, and, and hopefully also more human. So, so from this point of view, I'd like to, to, to ask you, yes, the question, uh, how smart, how smart uh, are you, is your city? Uh, Carlo, I have to tell you that I've never really liked this question, um, because uh, asking how smart your city is implies that if you don't do certain things, then you're dumb. Um, let me say that, that uh, um, Lavasa has embraced many of the technologies that have been on display here and at many of the other city conferences. It's been designed with uh, GIS and we use digitized uh, terrestrial laser mapping and we have optical fiber cable to all of the buildings and, and, and lots of other technologies. But, but ultimately, whether it's smart, I don't think is, is there a lot of technology there? I think it really has to be, does it help us provide services better, faster, cheaper, uh, which I think is another way of asking, is it sustainable? Not just environmentally sustainable, but also socially and financially sustainable. And so if it is um, scoring well as a sustainable place and, uh, and is meeting some criteria, which we're still having trouble getting our arms around, something that brings all three of those elements of community sustainability together in a measurable way, then we're all then 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 we're all over it. Uh, sometimes that's a that's a technology solution. Sometimes it's not a technology solution. But if it makes it better, faster, cheaper, that's what I'm all about. And particularly given the market that we're in, you know, in India, where we have uh, um, where we're trying to replicate a, a model that, that, that isn't somehow a, a, a picture of a sci-fi city, but one that one that, one that can meet a market need and as well as a price point. I think that's, that's a better way to look at, at whether or not it's a smart city. So yes, I think we're a smart city, but I want to redefine the starting point. But, but, but you believe that actually we are at a point where you know, there's a kind of almost, uh, uh, it's, it's a kind of leapfrogging moment when um, actually the, the, the things are changing and technology can help us provide many services in a faster, cheaper way or Absolutely. better, cheaper way. Absolutely. So, no, no, I, I agree completely. And, uh, and we embrace, as many of the other cities represented here do, some of the technologies that, that have made it possible to provide services in a, in a much cheaper way. I, I just take a little bit of exception to the, to, yeah. to the notion that you know, smart has to mean there's all, that always, it's, it's a technology solution and so. The, the, the question was phrased that way also to, right, to, right. to, to provoke this. <laughs> uh, in, but from this point of view, one, one additional point. So from uh, the point of view of new technologies, what are the aspects you think that uh, are most exciting as a beginning? Is it you know, about traffic? Is it about uh, energy consumption? Is it about, uh, what, what is it? Um, the most 
exciting applications that, that, that I guess give me a buzz are the ones that, that where we can get multiple uses out of it. That it, it, maybe it's gathered for, for one purpose, but it also has information for our security personnel. Or it's, it's, it's uh, we, we, we have smart meters, and, but, but the data we get from smart meters can be used for a lot of other things besides just our water and sewer utility. And I think that's, that's the real joy of working with, with some of this technology. Thanks. Um, and Jack? I mean, I can add, you know, the city, I, I completely with you, Scott. I mean, there are two key elements that make a city smart. And the, the first major element before the technology is efficient social interaction. You know, one, one of the uh, problems we have in Russia, it typically takes about a year and a half to two years to get a construction permit. Um, in Skolkovo, it takes us approximately 30 to 60 days, right? Um, because if you look at the Russian uh, construction norms, right, and codes, it's a very complex, archaic process. And the, the law gave us the ability to streamline these, uh, these processes, right? I actually sign off on the construction um, approvals. Again, something that's unique and innovative, right? So really, Skolkovo has allowed us to basically, you know, uh, create new systems of governance, right? On, right now, we haven't built the city yet, but in terms of designing the city and entitling the city. Right, that's, that's the first step. How, how do you create efficient and, uh, and productive social um, interaction? So we feel like um, having a mixed-use community, right? One of the bigger problems we have in Moscow is that it's, uh, the, the traffic jams are just uh, horrendous, right? And that creates a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, drag on the local economy. Um, so if everyone is in the city and they have all the amenities, that already is the, the, the essence of a smart city. Um, so transitioning to the technology, um, you know, everyone is fighting today for, for capital, for investments, right? Cap capital has no flag. They'll go where the rules are clear, where the, where the system of governance is transparent, and there's, a, um, there's an infrastructure. Um, so, you know, you do have to have the technology. So we believe very strongly, based on the men benchmarks that we did with, uh, around the world with Asia, with, with, with Europe, Middle East, and, and, and the U.S., that you need to have a very strong ICT network, which will allow data to flow through that network. Um, and it, at the end of the day, that data needs to go to an integrated operations center, right? So, so beyond this, the, let's say, quote, unquote, soft stuff, you need to have actual physical infrastructure that will make your city um, competitive. Um, and so we're, we're creating that. So that's what we view as a smart city. Thank you. Jane? Okay. Uh, uh, in Suzhou Industrial uh, industry Park, uh, now we are doing more about uh, smart growth. And uh, the one thing is to make the, uh, because I have mentioned about we already uh, completed all the construction all the, uh, for the uh, area. So now we are doing some planning for to renew the city. So now uh, the first uh, first thing is we are make the uh, land use more mi mixed use, and so the people are more convenient for to uh, from work to live live places, and uh, so the mixed use uh, mixed land use is uh, one idea for this place, and the second one is. Uh, uh, we uh, increase more facilities for the local people uh, because in the beginning, I think the places pay more attention to the uh, to the immigrants, and now we uh, have more facilities for the local people. Uh, for example, li like uh, education and the medical um, medical systems and uh, some amenities. Uh, and the third one is we. Uh, uh, we change the tra uh, transportation system and uh, we make more uh, public system, public transportation system and uh, pedestrian system. And uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, we, uh, we have the, we let the uh, city grow more low carbon. Yeah, I, I think uh, this, this is the idea for the uh, transition, yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, let me back, uh, go back to addressing the question. Number one, I think that uh, smart has uh, been overused like green and, and it become a marketing tool that is almost meaningless in, in, in many ways. Um, so let's kind of drill in and to, to think about what it means, right? It means that uh, you, ha you have the ability, you have the network to transmit data. And then hopefully 
companies, individuals, etc., will innovate and create applications that that will allow you that allow people to interact with the system, but also with each other. The first part is what we can do: create an open platform, create the right uh, environment, the right network, the right infrastructure. And that's, by the way, doesn't cost much, right? It's less than 5% of your, your overall infrastructure cost. The hard part is to actually bring people who can actually create these apps and uh, for um, the, the, um, the customer resident stakeholder to be able to use them. So that, that I, uh, I wanted to clarify. Uh, but for us, I think the, smart, the most important part, because this all comes naturally, you provide the environment, there is a market for it, people come in and innovate. The hardest part is around government. What we need is smart government. And if you think about a lot of the social problems that, that uh, people around the world have, it's really about the municipality. It's not always national. So a lot of it is, is municipality-based. And I think I appreciate what the government in Saudi Arabia has done within, with, within the Economic City Initiative. One of the things they have put there within the Economic City law is a key performance indicator for government. It says basically every government service within the economic cities have to be provided 60 minutes, in, within 60 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So basically you have to be constantly uh, able to provide these services. And there is a KPI, mandated, mandated KPI on every government. That's smart government uh, to me. And also means that the government obviously cannot deliver without actually creating the right IT uh, you know, uh, system for, to provide these services. And when you have the right IT platform, you actually have better transparency, better customer service, et cetera. So I like the fact that governments can actually drill through this. And this is really, I think, the next generation of municipal service and municipal government services. Thank you. Thanks. And so you see a lot of threads about you know, what the priorities might be, more to use uh, smart technologies or however you want to call them, but new technologies in order to make uh, the governance, uh, to work at the governance level or the procedure level, or about doing things about traffic or, or some of the other important issues in the city. And as we are drawing to an, an end of this panel, uh, there's actually one more fundamental question I wanted to ask you. That, you know, it seems that there's very different motivations behind your cities. You know, some, some really have this motivation, the idea of uh, turning like an old economy into something more competitive on the global scale, actually probably in both, in, in two cases here. Uh, in, other, uh, in other cases, uh, is, uh, is about really providing homes and, and cities and also product, production activities for, for a large chunk of the population. Uh, so, um, so the question is more like, uh, um, if you had to summarize it in one sentence, really 30 seconds, uh, why are you doing this? I mean, what are the motivations behind and, you know, what is your, uh, what is your vision? Should I start? Yeah. Well, 65% of the population of Saudi Arabia is under 30 years old. We need 4 million housing units over the next 15 years and 3 million jobs over the next 5 years. Any city, new city, that does not address the issues of job, and housing will fail. Yeah, Chin. Okay, uh, I think in China, uh, because uh, that's it, we have a big population and uh, we need to create, create the job opportunity and uh, stimulate the economic growth. Because in China, we normally say we, in, the, um, in the next 20 years, we have to ensure the 8% uh, uh, GDP growth um, because this rate will be ensure the job opt opportunities for the Chinese. So I think this is the most important reason for us. 50% yeah. um, of Russia's tax receipts are from oil and gas sales. We need to change that quickly. Great. I've already, I think, partly answered your yeah. question. Uh, India uh, needs a different uh, way of housing its, uh, its urban population. Um, if there really are to be several hundred uh, cities uh, built, uh, and, and this can be a model that can be replicated several times over, that could take 30 to 35 percent of, uh, of that migration, which, is, uh, which certainly is a significant diversion from, um, uh, from existing urban cities in, in India. So that's the model we're trying to create. Thanks. And um, so now as, we, as we're wrapping up, so uh, in the spirit of uh, bottom-up open source uh, type of uh, participation, participatory thing, uh, I think we would like to take a few questions from the floor. Uh, I think there's one here in the third row. And there's one down there later. 
in the third one there. I think we probably can have three or four quite quick. If you can just, you know, pose your question as uh, concisely as possible, and we'll also answer as concisely. Um, Angus Gavin, Urban Development Director for Solidaire in Beirut. Um, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by the challenge in China. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, but I'm worried about an issue which Carlo raised is basically, and something that concerns us, because we're involved in quite a number of large-scale urban developments and planning and building new cities. Uh, it's <coughs> that we need, to, we, we try to find a way to replicate the process, the urbanization process, which normally takes place, takes two or three hundred years, into a period of maybe 15, 20 years. Um, and, you know, we, we are trying to think of mechanisms mechanisms to do that and I think there are but is this something that you can you are concerned about because it, it, it is I think a real challenge because you know people like to live in an environment where there is some obvious context and variety and some sort of uh, identity with the past perhaps is this something that uh, that you're concerned about and are you thinking about that in developing this huge range, challenging range of cities. Thank you. Chin, would you like to take that? So, um, I think I need to make, make more clear. Um, but, well, you know, um, it's about, I, I would say it's about the feedback loops that uh, happen in traditional cities. That usually cities take time and need feedback loops in order to create a, to, to, to evolve and keep on adjusting and create a sense of place. And so given the speed of urbanization, you see a problem with that, with the inability or the difficulty of having those feedback loops, or is there any way we can actually accelerate traditional city growth so that you can match today's speed? Uh, actually, uh, I think in China now, uh, uh, the, the, the we use uh, uh, we invest a lot of uh, investment on the infrastructure uh, to create uh, uh, to stim stimulate the economic growth and uh, for the urban growth i think uh, now in, in china um, it is uh, very fast because uh, i think there are two things one uh, Two reasons. One reason is because more and more uh, village people move to the city, and another uh, reason is because uh, the uh, local government get, get revenue from the land selling. So, um, but uh, now in China, urbanization is still still the most important strategy for the uh, country. Uh, this is where uh, stimu stimulate the economic, and uh, this is important for the next uh, five or 10 years in China, yeah, at, at Thanks. least. Thanks, uh, I think there was a question there. My name is Leone Strelitz. I, I very much appreciate the pressure of having to deliver something uh, on such a rapid program, but I'm responding to Fard's uh, description of a city as just a bunch of products which I have to say I feel very uncomfortable with. I don't know whether anyone else in the audience particularly warms to that description. And if we think about cities that we know and love and all of the incidental interstitial aspects that give them uh, enjoyment and pleasure and tacit uh, meaning, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be productive for you to concentrate on evaluating those kinds of attributes and think about how you might be able to facilitate uh, in the cities that you're delivering so rapidly, the opportunity for people to invest their own meanings and um, uh, labels and identities on the cities that you're all developing. No, thank you for that, and I, and I appreciate and uh, you giving me an opportunity to clarify. Look, when you are choosing a city, when you're choosing a place to live, you're not just choosing, uh, choosing the apartment, the house, you're really choosing the neighborhood, you're choosing the schools, you're choosing the people that you live with, right? So when I talk about a product, I don't talk about a product that you just simply buy. There are specifications of a product, and I apologize for you know, sort of professionalizing the, the romantic uh, notion of a city and living in a city, 
But I have to think about it this way because at the end of the day, uh, you know, this, but the idea of, you know, I enjoy Paris as much as anybody. I enjoy strolling down the streets and, and meeting people randomly and, and, and going to different restaurants, etc. But I consider, I consider that a product of Paris. So from that perspective, I see it as a product. I'd like to just add something. I mean, you know, f certainly our timelines are shorter, but we have no choice. You know, the Russian GDP is 1.3, 1.4 trillion, right? Compared to US GDP, which is, you know, t 10 times that at least. We, we have to catch up to the rest of the world. And so while the cycle times may be traditionally much longer, um, on the other hand, on, one, on, the one, on, the hand, on the other hand, we have to move forward. Um, and I can tell you there's a very creative process happening. It's very intense. Um, it's day to day. Um, I come to work every day. I don't know. I, I know the day will start. I have no idea how it will end because there is all these creative individuals from business, from real estate, from uh, academia, from the social sciences who have been accumulated to create the city, um, to diversify the economy. And of course, we make mistakes, right? There are challenges, there are issues, but um, we have to create this um, for, because this is what our citizens demand of us in Russia. I acknowledge, as I think the last two questions really were, were implying, that the city is not just the sum of its parts, that we need to make sure that the city has a soul, uh, however we may define that to be and however we, we experience that. But, um, uh, but in the Asian context, uh, in, in China and India, I think that the pressures are so extreme, which is not to say that we shouldn't tend to that. Let me come back to that. But people come from Mumbai all the time to our community uh, very interested in moving there because they are tired of spending two and a half hours each way in, in congested traffic. They're, they're tired of, of pollution everywhere. They're tired of, of their, their children being too sick because of, because of air pollution. And so um, they're willing to consider something else because that's, that's what urbanization uh, is, is threatened with today, much less in the year 2050. Regardless of that imperative, I take the point. And, and because it is a point to, to be taken that the cities do have to have a soul, I think that those of us who are building new cities have to take deliberate actions in the development years, in those early years when, like the plaza here on Sunday afternoon, it's kind of bleak, <laughs> uh, to have, even if it's somewhat artificial, to, to have those activities, those, 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 uh, those special events, so that, so that uh, we can prime the pump and, and eventually the, the human social activity and, and, and our normal connections will eventually take over as I'm confident that they will. And, um, and uh, guys, I, I see like there's 10 hands raised and I think this is great, but I, I'm hearing their other hands telling me, please stop uh, because time is over. But I think that the, all these hands are actually showing something that I think was, uh, more questions. Uh, seems very important. I'm really told that we, we should. Uh, two we more should... questions we can do. No? Huh? Is that it? I, I'm, I'm happy. Okay, let, let's do a bottom yeah, up way. So let's do a, a small let's Arab Spring and then. Uh, and you can leave if you like. Two, two, <laughs> a few additional questions. Who should be next? I do have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so the power of technology. You can, you can start. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. I'll try to make it very quick. Uh, my question kind of um, reattached to the previous question, but maybe on a more uh, political level. Uh, you've been talking about cities run as corporations, uh, which makes sense in the idea of service, in the idea of customers rather than citizens. And I can understand why, why you're going there and probably makes sense. My question is more um, political. If you take France, for example, there's been this very steep uh, change in politics just yesterday in France. We went from right to left. Um, if I were to live in one of your cities, at what point um, my children's opinions, which will not be the ones who have signed the contract with you, but will be people born in that city, raised in that city, and will not have a link other than mine with your corporation, if they decide to go politically very differently from whatever was your uh, ideas when you built the city, at which point uh, does, that what does the conflict of interest come in? Uh, 20 years down the road? Great question. I think, Thank you. Um, I, I think that, so we have to evaluate the experience that you have now in any of the cities, okay? I was not saying that our experience is perfect. I'm just saying it's addressing some of the questions in a more faster, uh, more uh, um, maybe effective in some cases way. Today, a lot of cities have citizens that have no voice. 
In fact, I would argue most cities have no voice. Even if you have a voice, it's not heard, it's not implemented, there are too many stakeholders. It's really you know, you know, diluted, if you will. So I'm not saying that our model is perfect and that these, uh, and the, maybe these imperfections will come in later. Uh, I'm just saying that it is another model of doing it and that it is okay for the private sector to participate. Guess what? We look at environmental sustainability probably more than any other city around the world. And we think about conservation more than about just, you know, just, just renewable energy. We think about cons conservation because it makes business sense. Uh, we, we looked at the smart city. We look at smart security, how to make the security less intrusive but still um, uh, very productive. By the way, we look at master planning for every income level because we don't want slums eventually in the city. So you have to think about cities and the, how effective are cities today at really addressing these concerns and whether the model that we are creating, is, is it better, is it worse, how? And if there are aspects, social aspects, that need to be taken care of, that we as a private sector developer might not want to or might not be the best at addressing, then the government has to step in. And here, the, we have a partnership with the government, so it's sort of a work in progress on you know, what happens in 10, 15, 20 years uh, as a city. And remember, even if we continue to own so much of the city, the, there are operating uh, issues, customers pay for it, and cities are mono not monopolies. Mm -hmm. People move in and out of cities all the time as well. Yeah. So, I, you, you have to take the question, you know, the, the env environment as a whole. And as we've broken the rules, so let's get uh, two more questions. So one, I can hey, see here. Uh, can I give a short answer to that? Uh, uh, okay, uh, okay, but very short. I'll, be, I'll try to be very short. I spent 20 years in the United States as a city manager serving elected officials who from election to election might be right or left. And uh, so I don't really think that, 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 that the question is about whether or not uh, your children or mine will take a different political viewpoint than, than the companies. I think our obligation is, is to set up a process that'll be sustaining and a process that, quite frankly, will provide a reasonable time for the investors to get a, re get a return on their investment. If the, if the processes uh, are, are set right, then once the, return, the investors have a return on their investment, 20 some years in, into the future, Having worked in local government and democratic setting, I believe that people who ha have come to create those processes and get good results and services from those processes won't, uh, won't throw them out, whether they're right or left. Thanks, Carl. Very quickly, really. So, so the, uh, the 18th and 19th century, uh, the thousands of people who were living on the tracks and had the wilderness. And many of them uh, became very successful economically, culturally, intellectually, et cetera, without local design cues. Uh, China and India have a long history of urban settlement. And so my question is, when building new cities in China and India, what are, what are the cues, what are the references uh, in terms of design that, are, that you're taking from your own nations that are being incorporated into the new cities? We haven't heard much about that. Yeah, very quickly, Chin, you wanna add just okay. uh, one sentence? Uh, in China, we have, I should say, different uh, references. For example, like uh, Suzhou case, uh, that is a national collaboration between the China and the Singapore. So uh, this uh, industry, uh, new city built, there are two reasons. One is to uh, protect the historical area because Suzhou is a historical, national historical city. So the new, all the development can be moved to the new places, could, could move, move to the Suzhou industry park. Another, uh, reason is to uh, mobilize more uh, international investment. I think this is, there are two reasons. And the, the model may be different from the America. This is uh, uh, more similar with the Singapore because uh, we, uh, not only the inf infrastructure, infrastructure, we have cooperation with Singapore, but also we send all the uh, city manager to the uh, Singapore training in the in the first uh, ten years, but uh, later uh, the local government uh, take over and um, manage it. Yeah, so uh, thank you. The different, yeah. Thank you. Well, now looking at the at the faces at the, at the door, we we needed to wrap up, and I, I thought you know this couldn't be like uh, like uh, there couldn't be like a better end uh, with uh, I think this uh, tangible you know willingness to participate and to to engage in this, and I think. Uh, it's probably, if you combine the last question, it's really about saying, you know, yes, the city, uh, it is a real estate development, it is a 
it is many things, but in the end, the key thing is about this uh, uh, kind of uh, mysterious bond that since thousands and thousands of years bring us together to actually live together. And you know, because the sum, the total becomes more of the sum of the parts. And so I think that's probably what we can take away from the, this panel. And please join me to thank all of our participants. Thank you.